Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is the uh, 9700A level biology, March 22, paper 5-2, and this is the second video which explains question 2 and 3. Now starting with question number 2, in the first video we have done question number 1, and in the second video now I am going to be handling the question 2 and 3. Now in the question 2, it's uh, usually there are only 2 questions in paper 5, but this paper it has been 3 questions, and the, very sh the third one is a very small question, short question. Uh, number two, uh, question, an invasive alien species is a species that has been introduced into an ecosystem where it is not normally found and causes harm to this ecosystem. So a new thing has come, alien, and a new species has been introduced and now it is causing some damage and harm to the ecosystem. Invasive alien species can change habitats, reduce biodiversity. So change habitats, reduce biodiversity and cause extinction of the native species. So one is the alien species and one is the native. Native means the one which have been there for years and years and years. And now we've got the new one. So the native a a species. Now there's a full stop after that and then it says salt cedar trees, or tamarix app, are invasive alien species. So you must know which one are the invasive. So salt cedar trees, tamarix app, are the invasive alien species, right? Species introduced to North America from Europe and Asia in the early 1800s. A biologist carried out an investigation into a woodland ecosystem next to the Virgin River in Arizona, North America. In the woodland, there were areas that contained only salt cedar trees. Now, the salt cedar trees were the ones, uh, other, the, the salt cedar were the invasive alien species. So the salt cedar trees and areas that contain a mixture of native trees and salt cedar trees. So salt cedar are the ones which have been, are the alien species and the native have not been given a name and just native trees. The biologist wanted to test the hypothesis that the diversity of rodents, mice and rats is lower in areas with only salt cedar trees than in areas with a mixture of native and salt cedar trees. So the diversity is lesser in areas with only the invasive alien species. Where there's a mixture, the diversity is more. So this is what you have to understand. So the biologists wanted to test the hypothesis that the, the number and the types, the diversity, the number and types of rodents, mice and rats is lesser where they were the invasive alien species. While where there was a mixture of native trees and salt cedar trees, the diversity was higher, diversity was more. Now it says identify the independent variable in this investigation. Now the independent variable is the one which you are discussing or changing. So it is the type of woodland. You could have said type of woodland or you could have also worded it a little differently and you could have said uh, presence or absence of native tree species. So presence or absence of the native tree species or you could have worded it in the words of the question and you could have said um, in terms of salt cedar and native trees. Uh, there were those which were mixed, both were present and in one only salt cedar were present. So that was the independent variable. You chose to study these two different types of woodlands. Number one with only the salt cedar trees and the one in which there was a mixture of native and salt cedar trees. Now coming to the B part of this question, the biologist decided to trap rodents, you know rodents were mice and rats, in an area with only salt cedar trees and to trap rodents in an area with a mixture of native and salt cedar trees. Now how did the biologist do this, How did the, what was the practical procedure, now that is given to you in these six points. Number one, place 25 small mammal traps at random sites in each area of woodland. So this was the woodland. And then you choose random sites. So this site, maybe this way, maybe this one, maybe this one, maybe this one. So it was a very random process. Then baited each trap with 10 gram of food for rodents. So they put some food for it and they weighed it. So it was 10 gram of food. Then checked each trap after 24 hours. Then identified any rodents cat caught in the trap. Then marked the rodents with an ear tag and released them back into the woodland. Then carried out this trapping process on four days in April. Important, four days in April. 
The number of different individuals of each rodent species trapped during the four trapping sessions was recorded. Number one, identify three variables other than the small mammal trap and the ear tag that the biologist standardized in this investigation. Now, the three variables, uh, identify three variables other than the small mammal trap and the ear tag. The bar. Now, in this, you could have come up with a number of things. Is Number one, 25 traps were uh, used in each area. So, that is standardized, 25 traps, same number of traps. Then, 25 traps were used in each trapping session. Same number of traps in each, number one in each area, number two in each session. Then the mass was the same standard 10 grams of food of the, for, the ro for the rodents, which was the bait. Then 24 hours before checking the trap, that was also a standardization. Then four days, four or the same number of days sessions for each area. And, and then the month, it was always the April, month of April. So the season and the timing and the month was always the same or the time of the year was the same. So these were the three variables. So these are about six points, but you could have given me any three of these. So I've uh, then now uh, given you all the exact words, 25 traps in each area, 25 traps in each trapping session, mass 10 grams of food for the rodents, time interval 24 hours before checking the traps and four days for each area. And the month was always April or the season or the time of the year was the same. Now, coming to part two of the question, describe a method that the biologist could have used to select the trap that to select the trap sites randomly. Now, it's a very simple thing. Random, you have these random uh, random calculators and these random numbers which your computer or your ta tablets can do. So, use a random number generator to give coordinates for trap sites. So, you divide the whole area into a numbers and uh, then you give it numbers one two three four five six and then uh, you have a random number generator you have these in your uh, phones tablets computers so any suitable method which you give me use a phone or a tablet to generate random numbers and then the use the numbers generated as coordinates or you can use it as a grid reference to locate each trap site so use a phone or a tablet to generate random numbers and use the numbers generated as a grid reference to locate each trap site. Part C of the question is uh, table 2.1 shows the results of this investigation of the investigation species. We have deer mouse, western harvest mouse, desert, desert wood rat, long tail pocket mouse, Merriam's kangaroo rat. Then area with only the salt cedar trees which is the invasive alien species. So 52010. Then area with a mixture, we had 4, 1, 1, 2, 1. And so here we have a total of 8 and here we have a total of 9. Simpson's index of diversity is a method of assessing biodiversity. The formula for Simpson's index of diversity is D is equal to 1 minus sum of N over N whole square. N is the number of individuals of each species present in the sample and big N is the total number of all individuals of all species present in the sample. So they've given you the formula. And then we say the Simpsons, now you see the formula was given to you and all that data was given to you. Now it says the Simpsons index of diversity D for the area with only salt cedar trees is 0 0.431. So, I mean, you immediately circle this. Now calculate Simpsons index of diversity for the area with a mixture of native tree species and salt cedar trees. You may use table 2.2 for your working. Write the value for Simpsons index of diversity on the dotted line give your answer to three significant figures so here we have here this whole table and you have got to figure this out and then you have to give me the simpsons index of diversity and this is two marks so the correct answer was 0 0.716 but 0 0.717 was also allowed and 0.718 was also allowed i'm not doing the working for all this i'm sure you all can figure that out and this was what was expected of you for 0.716 you got two marks now 0.531 was the only salt cedar trees 0.716 was a mixture of native trees and salt cedar trees with reference to table 2.1 and the values for d in the two different areas state and explain the conclusions that can be made from the results of this investigation now you can see this is the working that you had to do 
uh, I thought we should do this so that you all can figure this out but actually the marks were 4.716 and then of course if you didn't do this this was 1 minus this so 1 minus 0 0.284 is 0 0.716 so if you didn't put this in then you were going to get this wrong so this is how you get 0 0.716 now coming on to this question with reference to table 2.1 and the values for d in the different so the mixture of trees is 0 0.716 and the only is 0 0.531. Now before we go on to the conclusions, let's look at this table 2.1. There are no desert wood rats. In salt cedar trees where there were only these one type of trees, there were no desert wood rats and there were no Merriam kangaroo rat. So none here and none here. So the number of species is much lesser here while here we have 41121. So maybe the salt cedar trees did not have enough food for them or maybe they didn't have the right nesting place for them or they didn't have the right uh, niche for them. So that is why they were not very, they were not abundantly found here. You've got to find out why animals would go wherever there is more food and wherever there is more place for them to nest and breed or that is where there is favorable such situations. If you look at the points that I have given you for this is the biodiversity in the area where the mixture of uh, native and salt is greater or higher than the biodiversity in only salt cedar trees. Or you can say the area with the mixture, this is not an or, these are two separate points. The area with mixture has more rodent species. But this is not going to get you a three marks because it says uh, D different state and explain. So you've got to give me one explanation. And the explanation for this would be very simple. The explanation would be is uh, only salt cedar trees has lesser food sources for rodents. Or you can see salt cedar tree provide less protection or shelter or nesting site or niche. So the explanations which I have given in green is going to be fewer food sources is only the salt cedar trees and lesser uh, the salt cedar trees provide less protection or less shelter or less nesting sites or less niches so this would be the explanation remember this three marks and three marks is for state and explain so when you read this you have to give me the state and you have to give me the explanation so explanations is maximum two and of course you've got to remember is that you have to give me one of that so conclusions any three from these the conclusions one mark and the explanations two mark so maximum explanations is maximum is two so this is how you would be marked uh, for this paper now coming uh, to the d part of the question figure 2.1 shows a deer mouse whatever from north america the biologists extended this study to investigate the abundance of the deer mouse this biologist, uh, the biologist wanted to test a new hypothesis that the abundance of the deer mouse is higher in areas with only salt cedar trees than in areas with a mixture of native and salt cedar. So the deer mouse is more in the salt cedar trees as compared to the one in which we have the mixture of the native and the salt cedar. The biologist used the trapping procedure described previously to calculate the abundance of the deer mouse in eight areas with only salt cedar trees and eight areas with a mixture of native and salt cedar. The biologist then calculated the mean abundance of the deer mouse. So mean was calculated, right, in each type of woodland. So the mean was calculated. Figure 2.2 shows the biologist results. So we've got the mean abundance of deer mouse in arbitrary units and areas with only salt cedar trees and areas with a mixture of native and uh, native tree species and salt cedar. So this is the figure 2.2. Now what they've asked you is, they've said the standard error SE for the mean abundance of the deer mouse in each type of woodland was 0 0.8 arbitrary units. Plot SE error bars on figure 2.2. Explain with reference. So this is for one mark. And explain with reference for figure 2.2 what these st SE standard error bars indicate about the data so explain with reference to figure 2.2 what these error bars indicate so one mark for that and two marks for the explanation so one mark is just for making the error bars and two marks are for the explanation now before we go into error bars and the overlap i wanted to see this diagram what does it mean when they overlap you see the error bars overlap now this is a diagram which is showing you this overlap then this has a less overlap and then there is no overlap. So what does error bar means? Now this is an overlap means you draw lines from here and you see 
and you see this and then you draw these lines and you draw these lines and you see there is an overlap here this is the overlap area that you have so you must know what does it mean when we say every bars overlap i think you do this in physics as well bars would be drawn like this that's one mark i've not drawn it with a ruler but you need to draw it with a ruler and that should get you your so 0.8 uh, above and 0.8 below part 2 is explain with reference that these sc error bars indicate about the data what do they indicate about the data yes they do indicate that uh, uh, how close the calculated sample mean is likely to the true or the real mean and there is an overlap in the error bars of the two means so how would you word it how close the calculated mean is to the real mean and the second is there's overlap in the error bars of the two means now you cannot say about the spread about the mean that's a separate story or you can set the reliability of the mean that is also not allowed so you must be very careful how you are going to word this uh, answer coming to part 3 the last part of this question the biologist then analyzed these data using a t test to compare the abundance of the deer mouse in the two types of woodland state and null hypothesis for the t test null hypothesis would be what there is no difference between the abundance of the deer mouse in areas with only salt cedar and areas with a mixture of native and salt cedar so basically there is no difference between the abundance of the deer mouse so whenever the null hypothesis is asked you have to understand null hypothesis is there is no difference between the abundance they are saying t test to compare the abundance so it's very easy to just negate it null hypothesis means you just negate the hypothesis so there is no difference between the abundance of deer mouse in the two types of woodland you could have mentioned that the one where you only have salt cedar trees and the one in which there is a mixture of salt cedar and native trees so that is the total 13 marks and still there is one more question to be dealt with now coming to question number 3 mussels are mollusks that live in sea water on the shore lines of coastal regions around the world mussels are a popular seafood and so are widely cultivated after harvesting the mussels the mussel farmer must replace them with young mussels this is often done by collecting young mussels from wild marine ecosystems so read the question carefully mussels are mollusks that live in sea water on the shores of coastal regions around the world mussels are a popular seafood and so are widely cultivated after harvesting the mussel the mussel farmer must replace them with young mussels this is often done by collecting young mussels from wild marine ecosystems Figure 3.1 shows mature mussels after harvesting. The slipper limpet, Crepidula fornicata, is an invasive alien species introduced into Europe from North America. Slipper limpets compete with the mussels, so these one are competing with the mussels. So slipper limpets compete with the mussels and reduce the yield of mussels because they must be competing for food or space or niche. Sometimes slipper limpets are accidentally collected with the young mussels. Mussel farmers want to prevent the introduction of slipper limpets when restocking their mussel farms. So when they're putting back the mussels, restocking their mussel farms, they don't want the slipper limpets to go with them. Now, figure 3.2 shows the slipper limpets. Now they look a little different. These look a little different. They look a little weird, and uh, looks like more of a boxing glove. and figure 3.2 right next scientists investigated the best way to kill these slipper limpets without harming the mussels investigated the best way the scientists put 30 slipper limpets into each of four trays so we had four trays 1 2 3 and 4 four trays and put 30 into each so 30 in this 30 in this 30 in this and 30 in this each tray of slipper limpets was exposed to a different test condition for a period of 3 days at a temperature of 12 to 13 degrees celsius the four test conditions are shown in table 3.1 so this is 1 this is 2 this is 3 and this is 4 so there were four uh, what did they say were they put it in four trays yes and each tray was exposed to different conditions now the first one was air exposure leave the organism exposed to air 
Number two was a brine rinse. At the start of day one, rinse organism with a saturated salt sodium chloride solution for five minutes and then leave exposed to the air. The third one was repeat the brine rinse. At the brine, sorry, repeat the brine rinse, not the brine. Repeat the brine rinse. At the start of day one, day two, and day three, rinse organism with a saturated salt solution for five minutes and then leave exposed to the air. Then the fourth was a brine soak. This was a brine soak. What did they do in this? At the start of day one, soak the organism in a saturated salt solution for one hour and then leave exposed to the air. So at the, at, in the brine rinse, it was start of day one, rinse organisms for five minutes and then leave. In the third one, at the start of day one, day two and three, rinse the organisms. And in the brine soak, at the start of the day, soak them for one hour. This procedure was repeated one with one tray of 30 limpets and one tray of 30 muscles for each of the four test conditions. So we had one tray of the 30 slipper limpets and we had one tray with the 30 muscles. The length was more than 30 millimeter. Here the length was less than 30 millimeter. After three days, the scientists counted the number of dead slipper limpets and dead muscles in each tray. The scientists repeated the whole investigation at a temperature of 4 degrees to 5 degrees using fresh samples of slipper limpets and muscles. The results of these tests are shown in figure 3.3a and figure 3.3b. A muscle farmer concluded from the results of the investigation shown that young muscles used to restock the muscle farm should be given a brine soak treatment, which is this one, a brine soak treatment to kill any slipper limpets that are present. Evaluate this conclusion. You should use the data in figure 3.3a and 3.3b to support your answer. And this is for how many marks? This is for four marks. Now let's look at the two tables. So this is 3.3a. And we've got all the data, the percentage death rate, air exposure, brine rinse, repeat brine rinse, and brine soak. So look at the percentage death rate and then what do we have? We have the B1 in which 4 to 5 degrees we have the percentage death rate. The key is these are the muscles, these are the slipper limpets and these are the now in the slipper limpets we have more than 30 millimeter and we have less than 30 millimeter. So you look at this graph this is figure 3.3 and this is 3.3a and 3.3b. Now look at it very carefully. I'm leaving it for a minute for you to watch this. Percentage death rate. Now you look at the percentage death rate of the muscle. Let's look at the percentage death rate. This is the percentage death rate. This is the muscle. This is the percentage death rate. And this is one at four to five degrees Celsius. And then look at the slipper limpet, more than 30 millimeter. Let's give it another color. And the ones which are less than, I want to give it another color, are these ones. This is less than 30 millimeter. Now these are the ones which have a very high percentage death rate. So look at it carefully, look at these graphs very carefully. And then let's go on to the other graph, the A graph. Now this was at 12 to 13 degrees Celsius. And look at the air exposure and look at now the percentage death rate. So you need to compare both of them and look at it very carefully and then see what are the common things and what are not the what are the discrepancies in it. Now the various points that were allowed in this was the brine soaks kill 100% of slipper limpets. Then brine soak and chilled conditions 4 degree to 5 degree kill fewer muscles than at 12 to 13 degrees. Then repeat the brine rinse and at 12 degrees to 13 degrees kills all slipper limpets and very few muscles so could be the best. And then you give me the data quote, brine uh, soak kills 47% muscles at 12 to 13 and brine soak kills 70% muscles at 4 to 5 degrees Celsius. Besides this, there were two reasons for the uncertainty. 
the uncertainty was only tested 30 individuals not enough repeats were done no data on the long term impact no results were for this small the less than 30 mm young muscles did not test with a mixture of slipper limpets and muscles and uh, and the and the important thing which you can write nearly in every one that does not support is that conclusion was not tested statistically we didn't do any t test or chi square test or any test which is a t- statistical test and the idea that there is a cost implication for the different treatments i mean the cost of doing all this how would it outweigh the benefits so the uncertainty was there as well So reasons for uncertainty only tested 30 individuals no data for long term impact no data for small less than 30 mm young muscles did not test with a mixture of slipper limpets and muscles conclusion was not tested statistically this is must, must be you must write this in if such a such a question comes and there is a cost implication for the different treatments that finishes this paper 5 and i hope this has been a helpful um, exercise uh please do look at it carefully pause the video and uh, read and uh, understand every point thank you very much and thanks for subscribing and thanks for watching